everybody again to the Art School Graduates Podcast. My name is Justin Robinson. And I'm Badir McCleary. Welcome to episode four. Yes. Four. We're here. Number four. <laughs> um, thank you all, everybody that's been showing us so much love on the podcast so far. It's been amazing. Um, we're we're enjoying it. Yes. You know, I, I hopefully I can speak for you, Justin, but we are we're definitely enjoying yes. it. And these topics make it that much easier, they, they you know, to, to, to talk they about. They just seem to get wilder and wilder. It's like we're trying to talk about good stuff, but then you get some wild stuff that hops up and you're just like, this has to be addressed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like for for a lot of the people that's doing the quote unquote wild stuff, you know, they're, I, we we have to say that they're doing it with good intentions. We don't know that the result comes out as well, but, you know, <laughs> we know that they have good intentions in mind. And uh, for those that don't know what we're talking about just yet, but we're talking about a lot of the climate protesters that have been, let's say, defacing not actual paintings, but let's just say the glass, <laughs> the glass right. of paintings. Right. Because no actual paintings have been destroyed in the making of these protests. But, you know, we can't say that their mission is not heard, you know, because they're getting the press. Um, we've seen uh, an uptick in the amount of them in the last month. Um, going using mashed potatoes to my favorite, the Campbell. I think it was no, it was actually Heinz ketchup soup. Yeah, Heinz soup. Yeah, Heinz like soup. Yeah. yeah, and I the big joke around that was that it would have been even funnier if she would have used Campbell's with the Warhol, <laughs> yeah. especially on a Van Gogh. Yeah. It would have been very, uh, very art specific. Yeah. Uh, and I probably would have had a better laugh about it. But Justin, what do you think about that? Do you think defacing these paintings and going to these places of arts education or arts appreciation is a good way to get this point across no because okay logistically it doesn't make any sense because these paintings are beyond protected they have mm -hmm. as much as we hate hate it and they're, they're protected we we can't do anything about it so it's just you throwing something on there there is a protective covering on there they're not just sitting there in the free air getting all this uh people breathing on them and dust flying on them no these are very well kept pieces of art and i just feel that mm -hmm. they're wasting their time doing that like it it's like a kid throwing a temper tantrum like what <laughs> what are you really I mean, getting out of this like nothing you just want people to look at you and then once you're done people are gonna be like that's a bad kid like why did you even do that because the party still goes on yeah yeah, it does. I mean, I I I agree with you. I I think. I mean, it's two things. I agree. Like I said, that the you you're the message is heard, but you're not getting far at all no. with defacing a, the glass of a piece of a work that's heavily protected, like a Van Gogh or a, a you know what whatever piece that's in you know one of the larger museums that you know, these uh, protesters have gone to and demonstrated in front of. Um, secondly, I think it's kind of like bad recon, yes. you know, because if you're if you're studying, there's plenty of other paintings. And I I don't advocate for no defacement <laughs> of any artwork at all. No, we don't. But, you know, there are artworks that aren't heavily guarded. Um, so then that kind of, you know, brings me to the question is what is it about that specific piece that the protesters feel that is going to drive their cause forward by defacing it's, it's almost like uh knocking the king off of his castle or knocking the king out of his castle or taking the crown off or doing something like that strictly because it's uh you have to go for the name brand in order to mm -hmm. get the eyes on you. You know what I mean? Like you, you're not, you're not going to get the but eyes on is, you doing it at a local gallery somewhere. No one's going to pay attention to that. You go into a, no, a, for a sure. larger gallery with security guards, it's air conditioned, temperatured and all that fun stuff. Guess what? People are going to be like, Oh no, we got to stop. This is crazy. It's like, they're going for, they're 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 just going for the bigger names because that's going to give them the greatest notoriety. 
I feel that. But at the same time, isn't the name in the museum? You know, like if you if you're going to the Van Gogh Museum and you're doing that at, you know, the Van Gogh Museum, or let's say you go to the Louvre or to the MoMA or any name brand, quote unquote, museum and just do it. You know, you're going to get the attention. For instance, the I think it was earlier in the year, uh, a, a crazy member at the MoMA, you know, jumped over yeah. the counter and decided he wanted to assault one of the staff at the MoMA. Yeah. You know, that right there caused a whole uproar, got the attention, unwanted attention up their security. But just doing it at the museum. He didn't have to do that in front of a painting. The act in itself regarded the attention and regarded the, you know, required the authorities, you know, to help shut that down. So couldn't, couldn't doing staging this protest act in front of, you know, or just in the museum period, let's say you did soup all through the entrance, right. you know, on the floor. Right. Wouldn't that be a, a distraction, more of a you, distraction? No one can get in at that point. You know what? With today's climate, people might actually think that's a performance piece. Like someone might actually, mm. they may not take it as serious. They might just be like, oh, this is a performance piece. This must be a new artist because it's not affecting anything. It's just stopping people from going in. But actually touching the art pieces is what brings the attention. You know what I mean? I feel that the name they they need to be connected to something that's going to bring that attention. That's it. That it's it's almost like they're going for low hanging fruit, like going to the Broad hmm. and messing up a Coons, or going to mm -hmm. LACMA and messing up uh, a Barber Kruger. Like it's just like you're going for low hanging, low hanging fruit. At the Broad, though, you can actually mess up. <laughs> one of those paintings though like if you stage that at the broad you could actually mess up a mark bradford you could actually mess up a condo yeah. you know or a warhol because they aren't you know as secure as you know many of those museums in europe do do you feel i guess my my question at that point is do you think americans are are that bold enough to do that or do we care about our art and our institutions enough to not do that are we that you know careful I, okay i don't think we care enough for art yet to be that careful mm -hmm. i think you have a handful of citizens that do enjoy it like me yourself uh a few other people we might know but the majority is probably going to these galleries as just probably a date night or probably to get out of the heat. Mm -hmm. It's never really for like uh, an educational purpose, unless it's um, like a school or if you're uh, researching something for art. So I think we mm -hmm. don't care enough to pay attention to it. And plus for us, it's like living in California, we have greater access to other things. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like we have mm -hmm. Rodeo Drive when Rodeo Drive was getting hit up. People are like, I might as well just go. I don't have to go to Macy's. I'm going to go right to the source. Rodeo Drive. Get get it straight mm -hmm. from get it straight from the uh, from the front door. So it's like we in California, it's almost like we know that if we do that, it's just going to be probably frowned upon and people will probably get made fun of versus like climate activists really paying attention to it because i feel in california we have a hundred other things that need that attention we have the homelessness we have the housing market we have uh sh political corruption so many other things that people would be like really like you're 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 bringing attention to something that no one the majority doesn't even care about to be honest yeah I mean, I, I I think about like, you know, 2020, you know, when all the protests were going on in, in L.A., nobody went to the museum at all to stage anything. No, they were you know, that wasn't even a thought, you know, in in my mind. I mean, I, I, you know, had the privilege of, you know, being out there and filming and taking photos of certain things. And none of the locations I went to was the museum. They were like, you know, no one thought about going to the museum. They, they, that wasn't. No. You know what and I mean? That's why I said the majority went to where the source was. Where did we go? Fairfax. Mm -hmm. What's on Fairfax? 
literally everything mm-hmm. cultural shoes clothing mm-hmm. uh music so they went there to get it it's like what am i gonna do with this art piece i can't sell this but if i break into this but- shoe store and get these Ner- jordans hey i can get these off pretty quick <laughs> Yeah, but the, they they did get one gallery. I, I can't remember the gallery's name, and I don't even think I would want to mention them because of it was you know horrible that happened. You know they got hit badly. You know I think they might have lost about a hundred k worth of stuff. Crazy video on YouTube where people are just it was wild as hell. Actually, people just snatching cause statues and running down the street. It was it was it was wild as hell. So I think that was more of opportunity. That wasn't a a mission that wasn't a you know a a a a a moment of like saying let's stop this so i i would take the protesters the climate protesters over smashing up a gallery any day well and plus those protesters or those thieves as we can say they were hype they're going for what's brand like I guarantee you, if it was mm-hmm. a regular gallery with a Van Gogh, they wouldn't know what they're looking. They're like, "This is something my grandmama lo- like." Facts. So I think they're going. And and hype. and those people had no, and they had nothing to no. do with the actual Absolutely. protest anyway. Absolutely. Those folks seen opportunity, and they they were like, "Holy shit!" You know, it's going down. So I see an opportunity. Let's just like you said, you see something on brand, and and, and we're going to get it. And it goes to the. The, back to the point of the the climate protesters, you know, at these quote unquote on brand institutions or these on brand artworks, if 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 the if the piece is not damaged or not destroyed or not even taken down for fear of uh, further attack, let's say like the Mona Lisa, is that a successful mission or does the success come in? with us being able to talk about it on the art school graduates podcast the conversation that's it because the mm-hmm. conversation mm-hmm. it's basically kind of like um as much as it i hate to say it, it's almost like the Kyrie effect right now where everyone is literally speaking mm-hmm. on him and it's like mm-hmm. i don't think he meant to do what he did but he did it and now mm-hmm. he has to face what happened and it's like these mm-hmm. climate people they are trying to do something but now that it's failed it's like now the conversation's being had of like security of paintings of protection of paintings of like oh are people going to be able to bring jackets in now like it's going to be like this whole Hmm. conversation that it happens it's like something comes up and then it brings attention to it's something and then the conversation is being had worldwide like everyone is speaking of it but i mean do do we really expect museums to act on things like this? I mean, we've we've seen stuff over the years. I mean, at Philadelphia Museum of Art, I think one of the there was a drunk patron that he was hanging around the, the terracotta statues uh-huh. and accidentally broke a thumb off of one of them or something like that. You know, thousand year statues <laughs> or something like that. And, you know, you're just letting people walk willy nilly, you know being able to knock them off how, how why aren't they protected where is the protection for these works if they hold that much value to that institution i think what it comes down to is two things they have the people that can fix it color correct it glue it attach it do whatever those people are on staff they know how to get in contact with them they know they just know how to fix it so it doesn't mm-hmm. lose like any close to no value they know how that but then the second thing is the insurance policy on these things are probably extremely high so it's like Mm -hmm. hey i could i can take a hit on you breaking this thumb because i doubled or tripled the price of the painting or the sculpture anyway because there's no way these galleries are just around here willy-nilly without insurance on every single piece because Oh, of course. Stupid of them. I mean, the museums, the museums, of course, you know, they're uh, insured up the wazoo. But even with that insurance, if let's say if a a Degas painting or a Manet or, you know, one of the Impressionists or Renaissance painters gets damaged, 
there isn't a, always a level of restoration that can bring that back to the quality you know that was hanging on the wall i mean we think about a piece like do you remember uh the beast jesus yeah yeah like that restoration like oh, yeah. what are you know like where where does where does where do we start and end with that? You know, if a piece is that destroyed, are we trusting today's artists to replicate Rembrandt? Are we trusting today's artists to replicate Thomas Hart Benton or, you know, Jacob Lawrence or Romari Bearden? Do we trust today? Do we do we have that type of skill level still? I, yeah, man, I just feel that they have people in place for that they have to have people that probably more in london versus you know uh, over the over the pond as they like to say probably more people over there that are more in tune with like preservations of these artworks but i honestly feel that with science and technology now they can find out and probably remake or mimic the color or the material they use mm -hmm. to try to fix it, try its best to fix it. Unlike the piece you mentioned earlier, which was almost, you know, damn near destroyed. That might take a little bit more time with years and months and multiple people looking at it from different backgrounds. But still, I think more on more, in europe versus the west coast i feel like in the united states that it's more popular to have these types of people on hand i'm gonna put a question out there do you think they do you think those pieces are real what you mean what uh the pieces which ones the ones that are up yeah do you think that there's not <laughs> much security up there because they're and i and i'm saying this because I was my first my first time when I went to the Louvre. It, it was in 2017, um, walking through the amazing, just amazing galleries of the Louvre. Um, and there was this gentleman there who was painting um, a replica of a painting that was on view. And I mean, spot freaking on um, to the actual size of the canvas everything. I'm going to try to find and search this picture while we're actually talking so I can okay. figure out which actual uh, photo, I mean, artist this was, but he literally was painting this thing exact. And that gets me to the question of like, do you think that the security, the I mean, because we're we're going to talk about you know the the value of these pieces later on in the episode with different auctions and things like that. But if we know that some of these pieces are literally priceless, then why would they have them so accessible to available damage? And that's why I asked: Do you think those pieces are potentially fake? See, that makes me want to get in my conspiracy bag because <laughs> I've definitely many a times my first adventure into a museum was the Getty. And I was like, and this is probably part of my own ignorance, too. I was like, ain't no way they got these pieces hanging up here <laughs> worth all this money and ain't nobody around them. I was like, this is incredible. I was like, I can sneeze and damage this piece right now. Like, exactly. So I, I tread on. I'm very much. 50 50 because i feel the ones that are maybe priced higher mm -hmm. are the real ones and i feel like those probably get replicated now that's just justin's take on it this isn't true don't don't hold this conspiracy theory <laughs> to any light but i just feel because it's just like you think about it like the um what's the piece the mona lisa that one's actually behind a glass case so that one to me, I think that's real. And I feel like the other is it though? might be. I think so. For it to, man, come on, bro. You can't. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do me like I that. I mean. I honestly think that it that has to be real because it's the level. Can of they risk it? Behind it. Can they yeah. risk it? I mean, like, think about it. I, I've, I've seen the Mona but Lisa. Also, but also think about how far away you have to stand from them. You're not that far. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. But also think about 
you have two security guards standing on either side too. Yes. So that gives me the that gives me the thought that that one's real. <laughs> they actually have a rope that says "Don't pass it." They treat it like the queen. Do not cross the queen's line when the when the when the soldiers are there and the people start messing with them. I feel like those security guards are known are 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 known to protect that with their life. Most definitely. And that the other ones that I don't I don't think so. It it brings me up to a saying in one of my favorite movies, you know, Gangs of New York. <laughs> you know, when Tammany, you know, he was saying, you know, we have to look like we're upholding the law even when we're breaking it. Yeah. That's why I said I'm 50-50. They got to give you the real stuff and then they got to they have to cut it. They got to cut their product. That's that's what you I'm can't thinking. Give them all real. That's what you I'm can't thinking. Give it all real. You you have to I again, we're just we're just speculating here. We're yes. not we're not talking anything, but I'm looking at for security purposes like okay, if the, we we brought up the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa has been attacked and stolen, all of the above, to where you know it has this, you know, this idea around it that people want it. You know, I don't know how many people today are trying to steal the Mona Lisa. Um, I, I like to think that they there's other more contemporary works that they probably would steal to get more yeah. of the immediate value out of it. The Mona Lisa is going to be damn near impossible to move. Um, yeah. But to keep that whole, you know, story up behind it, you know, it's like the Damien Hurst effect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you, you yeah, have yeah, to yeah. keep the story up at this point. It doesn't matter if it's real or not. No one's going back there to check it. You can't. No, only by only the people inside know if it's real or not. That's very true. And even to the Damien Hurst effect where he was burning his real paintings because people would have people were preferring the NFTs. It's almost like and he turned that into a performance piece. So, but I'm not going to say these art galleries are going to start burning real pieces, bro. I don't think. Oh, I don't, hell, I, no. I, I, <laughs> hell no. Hell <laughs> no. I'm not going near it at all. But what I'm saying I, is like. And again, no, it's it's mind you, I'm I'm probably thinking like national treasure, like Nicolas Cage. Yeah. You know? yeah but yeah. you know, even with like, you know, being from Philadelphia and being able to go and, you know, see the Liberty Bell and these things, like of course you can't hide the Liberty Bell. But there's a lot of different documents that they're just not gonna have out for the public and you know, just even natural disasters, you know, things like that. You know, the, I, I agree. the Mona Lisa is at the point to where just getting there in front of it satisfies the visitor. Yeah. No one's going, you don't, you can't even get that close to see how it's painted. You can't check brush strokes. You can't check. You're already blown away by how small the canvas is compared to how you've made it up in your mind. You know, right. you, you <laughs> can't do any of that. So at this point, do they have to put the real thing there to keep up the the narrative of it? I don't think that they do. And that's what it makes me think of with these other pieces. It's like, all right, this Van Gogh is up there. You know, just like Justin said, they've got people that can, they got science that, you know, can figure out which paints were used, what type of things yeah. go. And they probably have someone in a village in Africa or Asia or something that repainted the exact same thing. And they could right. keep that up there because it just satisfies the viewer. You don't think that that's possible? Yeah, I do. But okay, so are you thinking? So are you thinking they're just cr creating the hype of it by by adding the security guards, adding the rope, adding the glass? Like we're gonna make them think it's the real thing, but it's not. I think there's a possibility, and and and, and I and I only say that because. At this point, that's what we as the viewer expect. Right. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm on that tread where I think it's real and I think the other ones are recreated because it's just that it, it's almost like trusting a toddler with scissors. That's not something you would do. So it's like you're going to trust these adults in this art gallery to not knock over something, not to touch something, not to do this, not to do that. I, I kind of go, I kind of, I'm on that 
frame of it. But I feel, I don't know. I don't know. This one really stumped me because I'm 50-50. I feel like 50% of them are and 50% of them are. or may, It might even be less. Yeah. It I'm, might uh, even be less. I mean, I, 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 again, we, we talked about, you know, do we think Americans, you know, would stage, you know, a protest at an art museum like this? I, I think the, the European communities have, they've grown up with a much more respect and love and importance for art to where they right. see art as a cultural signifier a little right. bit more than we do. So they, their attack on art is an attack on the narrative, you know, the overall yeah. narrative of what yeah. the art world is. Um, I think we see the people as that, you know, not yeah. the, that, not the art, not the world. actual piece. Yeah. Not the yes. artwork, you know? So I think they would have a better chance of getting their message across as I mean, if they were to go to the owners of the of the Louvre, the owners of these different galleries and museums and say, hey, you're making all this much money off of people coming to see and you buying this, make a donation. That, that would be bigger when you pull out receipts and no one replies to you, no one answers you, you're, you have the email. That, I think that probably would hold stronger than, uh, you know, because think about it, when the first person glued their hand on the painting, we we don't even know who they are anymore. Mm. Like we're already on the fifth one, and we're just kind of like, y'all bored? Go watch TV. Go watch some Netflix. Or yeah. Like y'all just bored. But it's like, but if you create that paper trail where you have mm -hmm. documentation, it becomes a different conversation where people are going to be like, "Yo, Lou, what's up? P people are hitting you. Why aren't you making a donation? Like, what's going on? Like, I think that's the way they should have went about it. Because mm. now I just because now you're going to have the people like us who are just like, so are these paintings real or are they not? Mm. So what am I paying to actually see? Mm -hmm. Like, so why am I standing in line to go into this place if it's not a real, you know, like, I don't know. I just feel like it just stirred the pot and it didn't, you didn't get nothing out of it. Yeah, like, no, it I, th it. I think your solution is actually pretty, pretty dope, actually, because then it has the leadership having to at least answer. Yep. You know, like yep. right now, their answer is, you know, these blah, blah, blahs are defiant. They're ruining cultural property. You know, it puts a bad light on them, not to everyone, um, right. you know, but to the quote unquote establishment or even to the art lover, because we don't like to right. see artworks destroyed. You know, there's other ways, you know, like, you know, and we're not here to tell anybody how to protest, but we feel that, you know, that could have been a little bit stronger because then you have to have leadership say, hey, you know, why aren't you addressing this? If you, you know, yep. if you care about this in your community or if you claim to be in support of these things, um, then maybe this should be on your agenda for answering, you know, like. I, yeah, I, I, I think so. I think so. I would agree with you. And then. I just think that would be like the almost perfect segue into our conversation we had yes. earlier about these auctions yes, and yes. the prices of these paintings. Yes, yes. I, I remember you sent them because you posted them one on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have the time, go check out his Instagram. They will be posted, Art Above Reality. And I'm telling you guys right now, the prices of these things will make your mouth drop. But dear, speak on these things, dude, because I, I I was Man. upset. I have one that I'm really upset about that I just was like, I just need $50, bro. Let me $50. <laughs> yeah, man, we all trying to get this money, you know, and, and do all this. Like, But I mean, some of those pieces were just really good, man. Like I was looking yeah. at some of them and I was like, damn, like I could... I could be coerced if I had the money and if I was balling in that blue chip circle to right. be a be a owner of one of these, man, if I had the access, you know, and it just was they were just simply amazing. But to the point, there was one point five billion dollars worth of art, you know, traded on the or bought and sold, I should say, yeah. on the first night. Yeah. 60 pieces. 1.5 billion. So you're telling you're telling me 60 pieces 
is equivalent to our what was it we had the powerball yeah or the yeah the powerball <laughs> yeah yeah That's yes wild. yes so that is the wild. the christie's hit the powerball just as oh, the the dang. the person in california hit it at the same night so right. 1.5 billion dollars in sales um i mean it was it was led by i mean just to be honest bro like some absolute killers man like some of those pieces in there were just like bro like I... so the pieces came from the paul g allen collection if you don't know who that is he's the former uh phoenix suns owner trailblazers and, oh trailblazers forgive me for portland trailblazers uh owner and uh dude just made wise decisions mm -hmm. when he had the funds because and a good eye oh yeah phenomenal eye and i feel like he was literally his his collection and family and people whoever runs his stuff now i guarantee you was probably had fat joe playing yesterday's price <laughs> is not today's price because man i'm telling you looking at this surat go for 150 million 150 Oh my! One goodness. fifty, and we were going through them ourselves. We're like the next highest was what one seventeen, one hundred seventeen. No, right? no, the next highest was that Cezanne for one thirty seven. Oh, the one thirty seven, yes. And then the other one was the one seventeen. The one seventeen. That's the Van Gogh. Yeah. And know. then you had one oh five, one oh seven. I'm like, bruh. Yeah, I mean, but these these are all like the top dogs, you know, yes. of the you know, impressionist, renaissance, uh, yeah. modern, you know, whatever the period, you know, sometimes I even get mixed up with what period some artists are in. Like, these are the bells of the ball, you know? Oh, yeah. And also a lot of these pieces haven't been seen publicly for a while. So Years. there's a lot of collectors that were dying to get some of these pieces 10, 15, 20 years ago that didn't have a chance, didn't have the access that Paul Allen had 20 years ago that now have the checkbook and the access to go along with it and have that been- The price has gone up. Yeah, the price has gone up, you know, for sure. But so has their holdings, you know, and they're able to yeah. afford it. I mean, think about, you know, 20 years, you know, when you're worth two, 300 million, the pieces that you see in 2022 that you would love to have. You know, if right. you if you got the chance to get them, aren't you going to get them? I think I would too. If I got if I have it, yes, for sure. Yeah, I would yeah. definitely have to agree with you on that. But let me ask you this, yep. Peter. Yep, yep. Seeing all this money move, how would you feel as the United States government, knowing that you have one point five one point five billion dollars move, and you can't you can't do anything about it what is your take on this like what do you feel how do you think this works between paintings and money and taxes and what is it what's actually happening here what do you think is actually happening here well i think the government's going to get some money you know because christie's has to pay taxes you know they you know they're making money so like they're an entity they're a public company well i don't think i don't even think they're public anymore uh um you know they're they they're going to have to pay taxes on their income um but you know for a lot of these collectors these are these are good tax breaks for them too you know what's what's, <laughs> yeah. what's a good way to you know not have to pay taxes on 150 million you know buy a painting, buy a painting <laughs> you know you know it's 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 a good it was one of those things like you know I, when i worked and i worked in the military um and also happy birthday to the Marine Corps. Um, when I worked in the military, there were times where, you know, in, in our unit, we had a certain budget, you know, yeah. and if you didn't spend that budget to the actual that. penny, they, they cut it that. for the next year. So you'd see weird purchases like $700 for a hammer, $100 for a toilet seat, $200 for a pack of markers, you know, right. all to keep that budget in line to make sure they're receiving certain things. So, I mean, if you're, if you're a collector 
And let's say you just made a profit of two hundred fifty million, and you know that the end of the year is coming, and you're about to possibly take a tax hit. That's right. You, the you, you don't you don't want to take that tax hit. So how do you no. how do you maneuver that money? You know, you can put it in you know cultural property. You know, and there's different things with 1031 exchanges and a bunch of other things that we can get into in another episode. And we possibly could bring in a tax professional to enlighten us a little bit further um, because we can get really deep, deep, deep on that. Um, But the real, the real interesting thing about it is like, you know, 1.5 billion, you know, that's more than some local municipalities, right? Like, you you know what I mean? Like, Definitely. There's little neighborhoods in, you know, Pennsylvania or Texas or Arkansas that do not bring one point five billion dollars in a year for their community or their town. You know, how does something right. like that do you think affect normal people? Do you think they really care or is it just like monopoly money? I think people care, but they're fighting to stay above water so much that mm-hmm. they're not paying attention to what's happened at, you know, an art auction. Mm-hmm. You know, these are hardworking blue collar people who are just fighting to make ends meet. So I don't believe they're paying attention to this. Now, some people who are kind of in that working blue class, which is a little, we're not poor but we're making enough that we're not super comfortable but we're good Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. we're kind of in that gap where we start to look at it because we're i would believe you know we are in that group because it's like we have investments we have crypto we read new york times la times we're reading these things to find out this information and then we see something like this happen and we're just like what is like what you know so i think yeah People at a certain salary rate is not paying to they're not paying attention to it. But then there's a group of people who are the educated group, the educated working class who is paying attention to it because. As some might think, like, you know, we want to get to that point where Mm -hmm. we could get comfortable enough to do something like this. But we understand, you know, there are things set up and things in place that are going to, you know keep us from doing it but at the same time we know it's obtainable Mm -hmm. but we just don't know how like we're 35 36 37 we might hit that in our 50s you Mm -hmm. know what i mean Mm -hmm. so it's like different things like that that like goes back to what you were saying like you know 20 years ago these people knew of these pieces but never could afford them now 20 years fast forward 20 years they got the checkbooks for them Mm -hmm. so some of us might be able to be in that group we just don't know but Depending on, back to what I said, depending on the class and where you are in that, mm-hmm. in the, in society's class, I don't think you're paying that much attention to how much the stuff costs. Yeah, man. And I, I, I agree with you. Like people, for the most part, they just hear the number. Yeah. You know, they'll see an article, art news, a pop up on Facebook or you know, they're here, the local news mention it because 1.5 billion is not a number to be missed, you know, oh, but you're not batting an eye yeah, <laughs> you're not batting an eye at all. But I, you know, I don't think the average person understands what a major asset class that is, you know, mm-hmm. especially for this country, um, the way that money moves. And mind you, this is just one collector on one night, right? You know, this these auction houses move billions of dollars annually. Yeah. And I, and I think what keeps people from wanting to get into it is that you also have to have uh, things in place so that when you purchase these pieces, Mm -hmm. you can retain their value. Yeah. No mom and pop from, South central can pull up and buy a Van Gogh and keep it in the garage in LA. Facts. That can't happen. They wouldn't even you let know you. What I mean, they wouldn't, they would throw a complete fit. So that's why I think it's more of a deterrent for some. And then for others, it's just more of like that, uh, uh, 
fish in a fishbowl effect where you're just swimming around looking. You know, you can mm-hmm. just see it, but you can never get to it. It's you a, know what I mean? It's it's kind of like it's it's almost like when you buy a painting like that, it's like you're managing yeah. like a child TV star. Right. You know what I mean? Because you're they're delicate. They're delicate, you know, and you have to you have to place them in the 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 spaces where they can thrive. You know, to yes. where th- it's safe, you know, it's secure, yes. you know, it's yes. able to be around like-minded, you know, uh, uh, works, you know, in the same fashion to where it can be explored and it can, yeah. you know, have its its materials and content expanded, you know. Yes. So, but it's also, again, like a child, it costs freaking money. Thank God I don't have kids yet. <laughs> you know, it costs freaking money. You know, like you said. The moment you, the moment that hammer drops on that artwork, you got to think about transportation costs, storage yep. costs, loaning yep. it out, um, insurance. Um, how are you going to just make that money? Back? How do you That's make the money thing. back? Because you, it's, there's no guarantee, you know, when it's time for you to sell it, that it's going to even be worth what you paid for it. Right. Because if you look at some of these prices, you can see. On some of these paintings, they give you the estimated value, mm-hmm. and it just and it soared right past it. Oh yeah, like the Pablo, like the Pablo Picasso lot number ten, estimated value three to five million, nine point four million. Like, come on, yeah. Look at the the next one, the Paul uh, Galgon, I probably missed Gauguin. His name. <laughs> Gauguin, yeah, estimated price was ten million. You did a hundred and five million. <laughs> Like, bruh, trust me. <laughs> I mean, this this is different. You're but, playing in a different league. You know, you know what? It, it reminds me. So there, there was this story, right? And I, it, it, it's hilarious because you just made me really, really think about this. Should that person that appraised the work at ten million dollars, should they be fired for a, a wrong or a incorrect proposal and i only asked that because there was a story a few months ago of these chinese pots right that were yes that were appraised for like that. three to five grand ended up going for yes. like was it like five million or something like that yeah five million and then the person that the the appraisal i think that the, the appraiser got fired or something like that that was with their staff and i was yeah. thinking like damn that ain't that's Auctions are about competition between two buyers, two potential buyers. How did that person know? Like, they're saying okay. like they oh they 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 valued it wrong. Like, I maybe maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Who's to say this person didn't value this goal game wrong? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Right. No, no, no. You're good, and and I could tell you're excited about it. <laughs> I, when I read that, I was like, ooh. They uh, hit them with the "you about to lose your job" because <laughs> there's no way, dude. That's a because what if? Just think of it this way: what if that was your pots mm-hmm. and someone said, "Yeah, it's about five grand," and you like what? Put it in the auction house. Let's see what we get. Five million. You're gonna be like, "Who's man's?" Is this, bro? <laughs> like, yo, somebody come get this dude out of here because there's no way because that could have cost somebody a lot of money. But, like, but that's bad. But I, I feel you, and you're right. But but that's that's off by a lot too. Like it, this was a hell just, of a lot. This this one was like okay, two to three million, and it went for nine. Okay, you're still in the millions. Yeah, you're not. You know what I mean. But the go- not, game was ten million. This went for a hundred. Yeah. So uh, okay, yeah, you about to lose your job. Yeah. So <laughs> like, but at the same time, it's like, should they though? If if the actual value of the market, if the like, if there's you know the replacement value or just the actual secondary market value of this item, checks out the last time with all the auction prices to be between three and five grand of a piece exactly like that, you can't determine with two buyers. The same thing with this Gauguin. If the if the last Gauguin piece, and mind you, I don't know what the last Gauguin piece sold for offhand, sold for. you know, right. but if it was around, especially for that type of piece, let's say it sold for five to eight mil. And they're saying, okay, we'll do 10 to 12 because of the price increase, you know, the, the, uh, 
the demand for Gauguin at this moment. No one guessed a hundred. Like you can't, you can't predict that. So I'm curious to know, you would probably know more than me about this. How do they go about evaluating these pieces? Are they looking at documentation? Is it research based? Like what type of things are they looking at? Are they looking at, okay, he bought this back in 1980 Mm -hmm. at this price, the market of paint of a Gauguin, the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 sold at this price. Like what are the steps for them to validate these pieces? That's what I'm more curious about. All of that, you know, and a little bit more, you know, it's, of course it's, it's going to start with the artist. You know, when you're looking at that price, it's like, who's that artist and what artwork of that artist is it you know is it right is it a work that's considered like the canon of art history like to where it changed yeah. painting you know what i mean if it's one of those you can expect a good number especially if it's in great condition which a lot of those usually are because if you're yeah. paying a good price for those you know pieces you're going to keep like we talked about you're going to keep it in great standing you know the provenance You know, who's owned it? You know, we talked about Paul Allen. Paul Allen was a major collector. You know, that piece, that piece wasn't just, and it it probably didn't just start at Paul Allen, right? You know, it had a good track record from a good dealer, maybe another auction house, maybe direct from the artist's studio. Who knows? You know, we're, we're not privy to the documentation. And then speaking on the documentation, the documentation is probably correct like a mug like audited but how are you yeah go ahead but how are you but how are they off so much then if they're if it's so correct like that to me just seems like you either got tired of looking at all these paintings and was just like bruh what is the last two sell for run it let's put it on there it's, it's, but it's 12 o'clock it's it's i mean think about it this way it's the same way if me and you walked up to the Foot Locker and saw the last pair of jordan ones and they was like, yo, y'all both want them. They starting at 200. Or I'm like, yo, I'd give you 225. Well, you like, well, I'll give you 300. Like, I'm like, well, F that. I'll give you 350. And you were dealing with people with unlimited money at certain points to where uh, they're not just dipping into their own pocket. They could be purchasing for foundations, for museums, yeah. for countries. <laughs> you know what I mean? To where yeah. something like, you know, the Salvador Mundi went for 400 million. You know, like you get you that get sounds like a Dubai price. Yeah, that sounds like, like a Dubai price. It, yeah, <laughs> like you know, you you get to bidding and you get to people that will do anything to have these pieces. And then it also goes on to, you know, what does this piece mean to the person that's trying to buy it? You know, does it what does that hundred million might not mean anything to them having that painting in the possession? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it could change the game for it like if italy could have back the mona lisa imagine what they would pay for it yeah Uh, okay okay. i see what you're getting at but should that person lose their job (laughs) i see what you're getting at when you started breaking it down like that i i i I don't think they should lose their job though i don't think so i don't i don't think they should lose their job at least give them a like a refresher course I don't even think a refresher course is necessary because if they follow in the protocol, if, if you're looking, if you, (laughs) if you were to do the same steps like that, the IRS looks for in an appraisal, you know what I mean? For work. And the IRS looks at your documentation and says, I see no errors here. And then the hierarchy of a Sotheby's or Christie's or the powers that be that has decades of experience in auctions and looking at works can look at your process and say, yeah. I don't see an error. You can't control what happens on the field. Like Mike Tyson says, you can do all that planning until you get punched in the mouth. Punched. Then everything goes out. Everything the goes out the window. <laughs> Once that thing probably hit 25 million, people probably didn't know what to do. That's true. I'm curious to know. I feel like we should watch one of these and just take our own little prices on it. Most I do that every auction. Yeah, I do it every auction, man. I'm getting I'm getting good at price prediction, man. Like it's one of those things to where you can just see, like, whoa, okay, like this is this is 
it's it's this price because of these things that are preceding it. You know, there are different exhibitions and different retrospectives and things that precede right. these uh, these auction houses. I mean, these auction uh, uh, sales that give new light to new artists and new pieces and people pass away. Unfortunately, people get divorced. And we talked about the three D's, you know, death, death and divorce, you know, where new works come onto the market and people have to have them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I don't know, man. Should they lose their job? I don't know. That's a lot of money they left on that table though. <laughs> but did they though? Because like, I would I would think if someone valued something at a price and you got more, that's like that's a good day. Got it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like because it's like yo, like it ain't my fault these two people got endless pockets and they decide they want to pay over the price for this. Yeah, they might feel it's worth that. You know? Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you, man. <laughs> That's man, that that was a good topic right there. I'm telling you, because a lot of people would have never thought of it that deep because it's so much to, to unpack there. <laughs> Facts. But, well, but dear, as we wind down this conversation, man, those were two, I think, very insightful conversations that people are probably going to wonder and probably even look up and look into themselves like about all this stuff. Yes. But here comes the highlight I would say for us and for our uh, fans that listen to the art school graduates podcast, which is our artist spotlight. So Badir, who are we speaking on for our artist spotlight? So today for our artist spotlight, we have the great Lee Bontaku who yeah. left us, this week uh at 91 years old um i mean she had a great artistic life over nine decades of just being a brilliant creator um and just bringing good ideas and thoughts you know to the walls and i personally appreciated her um i always like to read a nice little piece uh this one is from art news um Bontaku had her artistic breakthrough in 1959 creating an immediately recognizable body of work that was unlike anything in the New York art world had seen before or since. Taking soil canvases that had been used in conveyor, conveyor belts and discarded by the laundry downstairs from her East Village loft on Avenue C, Bontaku cut up and found these canvases, further dirtied with suit and coarsely stitched them together with wire and wielded over steel armatures, always with a looming void near its center. I look at that paragraph because I always wonder how the hell she created <laughs> these artworks because they were intimidating, I, bro. Like <laughs> they are. And if you see the scale of them and then you see her, you're like, mm -hmm. how did you do this? Yeah. But I remember when we were speaking on her uh, and I looked into her artworks, I was like, dude, these things look like portals. Facts. It looks like it's either an eye that's taking you in or an eye that's pushing you out. But it's the, the art piece is demanding your attention. Mm. Like it's telling you to focus. I feel like it's telling you to focus. But I also loved her her drawings. Yeah, those, man. The, those drawings are next level. I'm like, she was on sci-fi before sci-fi was even a word. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, it's, it's funny you say that because I always wondered if she did set design. I had to look, you know, into that. Mm, and, yeah. you know, because I could see, you know, her doing some crazy set design just from yes. building a whole bunch of just different form things in the background. But, yeah. you know. 91 years man like we can only hope we get that amount of time and just be creative and just to leave something as beautiful as those works on the wall i actually yes. just seen her work actually five different times at five different museums over the last week and a half and oh, man. always always a pleasure to see so rest in peace lee rest in peace yes yes well ladies and gentlemen Thank you for listening to the Art School Graduates Podcast. Yeah. My name is Justin Robinson. And I'm Badir McCleary. We catch y'all next time. 